just close that window. No, no, one below. Hi, uh, good morning, and I guess it's almost not morning anymore. Uh, that was a brilliant talk. Actually, I've known Professor Bala for about 15 years, and uh, many ways, the spirit of the things that he talked about, and some of the ways in which they're going about doing their work, and some of the comments he made in the end about what it takes to do scaling and so on, are exactly the uh, kind of uh, problems and opportunities that we are also uh, looking at. And so, in many ways, I think, you know, I'm very inspired not only by his talk, but also I think it's a nice setup for our talk. Uh, when you think about artificial intelligence, right, I mean, it's like, uh, it's generally believed that AI is here and it's going to change our lives and transform the way we do things. What are the top three major applications or uses of AI that comes to your mind? Anyone? Health. Health. I wish it's been th that much, but yeah, yeah. probably. <laughs> but what, sorry? Virtual assistance. You mean like in conversational assistance and so on? Education. Education. No, these are the ones we would desire, but what do you think is actually happening? <laughs> so the most, uh, you know, obvious one is self-driving cars, right? It's like the big AI story. But of course, the one that you all use every day is on your online social networking or e-commerce and, you know, which sort of influences the way you do your shopping and search and so on. But, you know, there are about 3 billion people in the world for whom none of these things matter. In their lives, uh, these type of applications and, prop, you know, uh, usages are not going to be the ones. Let me see, how do I move forward in this? Uh, okay, sorry, I go back. Um, yeah, so this is a video, trying to figure out how to start the video because it's like with the, you know, it's not self-starting. Sorry about that. It's, uh, okay, let me just do one thing. Go back and forward. Hang on. Okay, let me try. No, it's not going back there. Sorry. No, no, no. See, I'm not able to make a change there. No, stop talking to it. Okay. What did you do? Okay, let's go back to the slideshow. Okay, so let me try if this video will play. Okay, you see, yeah. So this is, what do you think is happening here just by looking at it, right? So there are three people involved. One of them is presumably the mother. The one who is actually holding the baby in the sack is a frontline health worker. This is happening somewhere in a village, uh, probably in Rajasthan. And there's a spring balance there. So what she's doing is actually measuring the weight of the baby. Uh, I'll tell you a story about it, but this is actually a by protocol, newborn babies are supposed to undergo a weighing process to determine the weight at birth. This of course is, you know, from the pictures you can tell, this is a TB patient. Uh, TB kills about a million people a year and it's the largest, in India, largest killer in the world. More people die of TB than malaria and HIV combined. And this is, you can might see, it's a cotton bud and inside there is a worm destroying the cotton plant. And Last year, 40% of cotton that was grown in Maharashtra and Gujarat uh, were destroyed by a few few bugs. One particular one called American bollworm was significantly responsible. There were about a thousand farmer suicides. So why am I telling you this? See, what we are looking at is how can we apply AI to address these kind of problems uh, for the communities like the people that you saw. And to do this, you know, in the current AI commercial sector work and the big uh, you know industries that are doing it are not going to naturally translate over and apply, right? So we have to make a special effort. Now, when we do this, you know, we are, you know, I'm going to tell you more about the problem that we're working on, but just to give a little bit of context, the way we look at it is that AI and AI-based technology is just the, only the one part of it. It's not 
necessarily always the essential part, but in many cases it can be transformative and can make a big difference. But that has to be embedded in some kind of a product that is usable in the context of like the frontline health worker if you are going to help them do the measurement better. It is not just AI, it is a bunch of other things that have to go with it. But overall these things have to be part of an ecosystem of solution. In fact, the frontline health workers are not simply weighing it, they are actually recording it and the recorded information goes somewhere and subsequently gets used. So, you have to look at the whole chain of why they are doing it and how that information is good getting used. Last of course, you know it has to be part of some type of a systems approach either for health or agriculture. So, what we really look at is that how can we address prob you know solve problems here taking into account all the ways in which things have to happen in the other domains. When we think about you know using AI we ask these questions, is this actually a very big problem? The baby birth weight problem, why is that important? I will tell you more about it. Uh, the cotton farming problem, obviously you already know with a thousand farmers so you said it must be an important problem. Does it have an AI solution? I mean there can be many problems in the world that can be solved, but there may not be any, any need for artificial intelligence. Well, even if it has artificial intelligence solution, is that really going to make a difference? In some cases, the biggest challenge may not be the artificial intelligence, the AI part may do its job but the system fails somewhere else. And even if that is the case, will the solution be used by stakeholders? For example, if you are trying to provide medical solutions to be used by doctors, the doctors should be willing to use it. I mean, they might either feel threatened by it or find it too much too burdensome to get untrained and use it. How can we address that? And of course, you know, AI does not work without good amount of data. In many of the social sector, social domains, data is extremely difficult to get. If it if is there, it is going to be poor quality. Can we get data? Can we build data if it is not there? Can we create data or can we instrument things in a way data can be gathered? And then of course, you know, we are not going to do it alone. These problems as I think Professor Bala already mentioned, ultimately there are a variety of other players who know how to work in these domains. They often turn out to be NGOs, not always necessarily so, but one big player in this is the government. A lot of the kind of social domain problems, the people in the social domain ultimately depend on government programs for their welfare. So, will the government be supportive? Will we will be able to work with them? Will a particular state government will be helpful? Because not a, all of these problems are solved at the central level. And are there NGOs and other partners who will be able to co-create and do that? And last but not least, if we do all of that, are there systems government programs that will take it to scale? Doing it in one city, one village, not enough. right? So, the way we go about doing our work is that in fact, we start looking at problem areas by looking at partners. So, when we started thinking about what areas to work on, you know there are some basic things, you have to make a living, you have to have you know basic health coverage, you have to have basic education, you have to have some degree of having financial capability to buy and sell things and have you know maybe even build a business and last but not least you need some infrastructure, utilities, uh, water, power, whatever. Those are naturally the domains where we want to work in. But in each of those there are plenty of organizations that have been working in that area. So, we started talking to them to understand what might be important problems, identify specific problems and then specific use cases within those problem domains. If it is cotton farming, what part of cotton farming do we want to address and then think about what would be an AI product or a solution that we can build and think not just build the solution, but also think about its usability. Again something Professor Bala touched you know very importantly, it is not just important to build the technology, you have to do the human human centric design to make the technology usable by the people that it is targeted to. In many cases, the people that we actually get the solutions to are not the end users, <coughs> there are intermediaries, I will tell you more about that. Then of course, we have to do field experiments, trials, finally pilots and small scale eventually taking to large scale. We are somewhere roughly in this part in some of our work and you know hopefully we will get to the other parts you know by the end of the year. So, we work with a number of partners in the social sector, uh, Gates Foundation is a biggie, they support a lot of NGOs. So, through them we can work with a variety of partners with Vadwani initiative for sustainable health is an NGO that is run by one of our donors. So, we work with them and they are very prominent in northern India. PATH is a worldwide organization, Tata Trusts. We work with governments both at the central and state level um, and we work with a bunch of other uh, academic institutions as partners. We are not a research you know paper writing academic organization. I built a research lab like that at Microsoft. This is quite different and again I am reminded of what Professor Bala said is that at this point I am not about solving AI research problems that are publishable, but rather addressing societal problems through AI. And we are not a commercial organization in this domain. Uh, having business or profit as a motive 
<coughs> can significantly delay your progress simply because this paying capacity does not exist and so you want to first solve the problem and then think about you know how it can be commercialized we want our innovations to have an impact and ultimately we will make it we are making it available free for social good applications now so let me go back to the uh, three problems that i mentioned right there are about 20 million uh, babies born with low birth weight low birth weight is defined as two and a half kilograms or below and in some cases 1.8 kilograms is considered critically low birth weight interestingly about 4 million uh, low birth weight babies in india are not captured so this process that i'm talking about fails more than 50 percent of the time why is that for 25 years or 30 years we've been sending spring balances to the field but there are many problems supply chain problems spring balances are not available maintenance problems once they lose the elasticity nobody fixes them then the kind of you know reductance to use it in the first place cumbersome process three people needed in some cases families there are taboos on external person touching the baby so this solution in fact is not working and the big you know the single most important correlate between a baby you know what the time of birth and potential for uh, infant mortality is actually the birth weight you measure that you get a chance at saving the baby and any number of reasons you know uh, for under reporting in fact uh, we found out that uh, the telangana government was telling us that about according to their measured estimates 10 percent of babies in telangana are underweight and they know actually it's more than 30 percent so that means the system is not working a person you know entries are made in some paper a person like this has to go through this and manually enter it into a system failure there but more interestingly what you would find is if you read this this is kind of sideways but uh, you can see here 2.5 kg 2.5 kg 2.5 kg you know what's happening there right it's not it's a little coincidental there are a lot of babies just at the threshold of the underweight because reporting underweight creates a lot of action so this is not a process you know that we can continue to do this way so of course being a vision person or a vision group what we thought about is can we actually think of a way of taking pictures of a baby or a short video using cell phone and somehow create a three-dimensional uh, shape model of the baby and use that three-dimensional shape model calibrated to measure the various parameter head circumference you know head to torso length head to toe length any number of other things including weight now of course how do you get weight from a picture a 3d model it turns out that the babies are nearly constant density they are mostly made up of water so the density is constant to up to about three percent if you get volume you get weight so the you know work has been inspired by some previous work that's been done on human shape modeling and we are kind of applying it to babies i'm not going to show that so this is like a latent space of babies now you realize this is a situation where we are not going to you know put the baby in a measuring device and do all kinds of things so you're going to do it casually if you're going to do that we are not going to see the back of the baby but however babies fall within a 20 parameter latent shape space and if we can actually take a particular baby's pictures and map it onto the space we can find out what the baby looks like so that's kind of what we are doing and we take a neural net approach to this take a video and from that we create a 3d model this is with reference to the ground truth all of this is synthetic data we haven't actually captured you know real baby measurements yet that takes a whole bunch of uh, processes and regulations and so on which is currently we are doing but the synthetic baby models are quite good actually but you know in terms of actually testing it on real video we have to capture it this is a synthesized video from the baby but we know given that data or given that information we can get fairly accurate 3d shape recognition of the baby so where we are now is actually we have just bought buying this new 3d scanner equipment to collect ground truth data working with about a dozen or more hospitals in Bombay and other areas and we are also working with a bunch of organization clinical research organizations that know how to collect you know babies in in the field sometimes it's called in the wild which sounds a little crazy but you know so we are basically in the data collection process right now that will happen through the next few months and hopefully by the end of the summer we would have enough data to uh, test these you know evaluate these algorithms or techniques on real data on real babies and then go from there right now why do we think this is actually doable see in india if you look about the public health care system there are about 900 million people who live you know who are poor people in india roughly live in villages and other places and they depend on a public health care system there are 25000 or 27000 primary health centers above them there are district hospitals and then you know um, uh, community hospitals and medical colleges but they are not many and <coughs> there are about 150000 sub centers roughly one for every four villages 
most people in rural India, poor people, go to one of these places for their healthcare. Unfortunately, they don't often go because getting there and prioritization of what they do with their time is a big issue. So there are one million ac accredited so social health activists or ASHA workers. These are not medically qualified people, eight standard education, community women who are now managed by the associated accredited, sorry, auxiliary nurse midwives who are at these health centers to go and visit and kind of uh, take care of what's going on. The big focus is actually maternal and child birth, pregnancy, uh, pregnancy risk, uh, safe pregnancy, baby delivery and early infant care is one of the places that they do a lot of effort. However, there's a lot of challenges in how they do it. But this is the system that can help us implement the solution. So we are very much connected with these organizations. Many NGOs in India are actually working with these organizations to increase their capacity to make them work better and to make them technologically enabled. Now, let me switch over to TB. Now, TB is a big killer, as I said. Um, you know, there are about 2.8 million, this number is actually disputed. Some people say it's 4 million TB patients in India every year, new patients. Only about a one and a half million or so are actually known. So in other words, roughly half the TB population are not even uh, captured. Right? So this is a big challenge. In fact, TB is a completely curable disease. And uh, the, but the rate at which it's decreasing in the world, it will take 100 years for TB to be eradicated. And the Indian government has 2025 as a goal for TB eradication. It's not going to happen unless we have find ways to capture the patients, get them screened, and I don't mean in a rude way, capture the patients, you know, find the patients, get them screened, and put them to treatment, right? And there is a loss at every stage, right? Now, fortunately, TB man management is actually a very highly organized system. There is an organization called the Central TB Division, and they have officers in states, they have TB officers, and all the, all, all the way down to the district level, whose job it is to, you know, go and find the cases, but it's very challenging, right? So they can, you know, seek some help. In fact, we are working with the Central TB Division, and the Central TB Division has uh, asked us to be their AI partner, and they have certain amount of data that they can share with us and so on. There are two major problems that, that we are trying to work on. One, here, can we actually, you know, bring in AI methods to kind of uh, is predict where the case densities are likely to be high, so the case workers can go in door-to-door -door -door screening in those places. You know, and the second is, can we actually help with adherence? I'll tell you about the second one in a bit, but in, on the caseload, something like a heat map about where the cases may be. This is the kind of stuff that we are trying to produce. How do we do it? Well, there are known TB cases, though 1.1 million, and once they are known, they are notified, they enter into the system called the Nikshai system, and they are tracked. And that gives us a place to start. But how do we now go to other places? There are broadly four factors to consider, right? Where are infectors? TB is contagious, and it's you know, con uh, transmitted through proximity coughing, uh, not uh, vector bond. Can we actually find some estimates of the infectors from the notified information as well as others? What are the causes of transmission, right? Mobility, population density, weather, climate, and so on. And who's most susceptible? And, you know, what's the strength of the health system? These are the kind of factors. And these things we can get as auxiliary data from population surveys, GIS information, and so on. So what we are looking at is that using these things to model where the cases may be and then, uh, you know, uh, help the case workers. On the other side, you know, TB is a very strange disease. The uh, drugs that you take to uh, get rid of TB can be so toxic that you really don't want to take it. It makes you feel ill and makes you feel bad. So what happens in many times is that after a few times, people feel begin to feel better after a few weeks, then they stop taking the medication. So you know what happens, right? The bacteria develops resistance to the drug. And so there are multiple drug resistant uh, TB uh, bacteria that's increasing. And so there's been a significant attempt uh, on the part of the public health system to make sure that people uh, you know, take their drugs. And it's called uh, TB adherence monitoring. There's a famous program called Directly Observable uh, Therapy, DOTS system. And in fact, uh, my former colleague at Microsoft Research, uh, Bill Thies, has developed a solution called 99 DOTS, which is one of the ones that is you know, nationally used at this point. So the DOTS system can address when we can actually take, tra track the patients. But if you're talking about 1.5 million, there is not enough people to make sure that you know, we track all of them or we follow up with all of them. So currently, this whole adherence management is reactive. If we see that someone is failing, we can do something. By that time, you know, we reach out to them, it can actually be late. 
can we be more proactive uh, actually, you know about it can we actually predict individually which notified patients are more or less likely to you know be at the risk of not adhering so this is something we are collaborating actually with uh, everwell which is the 99 dots organizations that built these has built as well as uh, university of southern california professor billin tombe and the central tb division so here you know we haven't uh, got any trial set we are kind of gathering data and waiting for data so switch to the agriculture problem cotton farming now if you look at the cascade of uh, you know farming and this is true of all you know crops cotton is a good example cotton is sort of the first major crash crop people actually uh, try to make money and make a good living and send their children to good college and schools so be by being cotton farmers wide in india india is the biggest cotton producing state in the world I mean, country in the world and maharashtra is the top cotton producing state in india but it's produced here in tamil nadu and uh, karnataka and other places as well i believe now you want to double the farmers income that's actually a national goal but you have to do the entire chain right you have to reduce the cost of production reduce losses increase yield and do the market analysis so we've looked at you know which parts of it we can actually take tackle and one problem we found out repeatedly where we may actually be able to help is actually the reduction of uh, losses now that's basically um, amounts to pest control and pest management which is a big challenge the way it works is that in cotton and in many other plants until you reach a certain threshold limit of pest infest infestation you are not advised to use pesticides because the pesticide causes a lot of other damage however that said cotton tends to overuse pesticide and in the wrong times and it's actually the biggest consumer of pesticide and the biggest consumer of water of almost all the plants that you would know so can we actually better manage the use of pesticides to do that i'll tell you how it's done today uh, this is actually traps let's keep over that and come back see the way it's done now for example in maharashtra is that there are agriculture extension workers these are similar to frontline workers in the head they are not uh, college educated they are not even often high school finished they go to villages typically in each village there will be like something called a demo plot and a lead farmer with whom they work a lot in order to help them decide what kind of seeds to plant what what to do and how to manage you know upcoming climate issues and things like that one of the things that they do is to actually make weekly visits and try to you know measure the infestation when it's coming and the way they do it is going back is that they uh, put up these traps on which the moths are captured these are sticky so this is called sticky trap yellow sticky trap there are a few other traps as well there are roughly six or so uh, bugs that plague cotton okay american bollworm uh, pink bollworm jacids sucking insect i don't remember the all all uh, six of them and there are slightly different traps there are about two or three kinds of traps that you have to use now once you have this you can actually you know inspect it and measure you know kind of get an estimate of how severe the infestation is you do that over a week or two uh, you might get a sense of if this is going to be severe or not and then you know whatever you do but the way it's done is that this data is entered in the you know you co it's what you call the um, it system of the national informatics informatic center in pune and that's aggregated however lots of false data not counting not counting properly some of these bugs are really small uh, the agriculture extension workers in fact don't even know how to recognize them so the data is very poor and noisy as a result rather than handling the data for each village the uh, nic integrates it aggregates it over 100 villages called a block once about once a week uh, the agriculture university in maharashtra and similar in other states experts get together and study this and then make a recommendation okay now it looks like things are getting bad they issue advisories the adv advisory issued for the entire say 100 block you can see how coarse this approach is right now of course as an ai vision person you know what to do so what we are looking at is that can we actually have a uh, farmers take pictures of these traps and then have an ai algorithm do the counting to give them you know immediate count response in fact this business of farmers taking pictures of these traps and uh, wanting counting done by experts is already going on except they use whatsapp or something other to communicate among themselves and others but still the response time is like a week or two and by that time things can be late so what we have done as you might uh, imagine is developed an app to count uh, the different you know recognize and count the different type of pests so this stuff is fairly well underway see we started this project about september or so uh, last year and we went and collected data immediately but by that time the season was a little advanced so there are broadly two cotton planting seasons in india planting season in india one called the karif season which is post monsoon and ends about january february and then a rabi season which is now 
which not a lot gets done. It turns out in the south, people do uh, plant in rabi season. In fact, we're going to go do, go do some field trials in the south. But in the Karif season, we captured you know a lot of data about these moths and trained our models. We're getting you know very good accuracy. Now what we are doing is actually working with uh, some farmers in some villages in Tamil Nadu, taking the same stuff, connecting additional delta, building new models, but also also starting to do field trials. So we are looking at. In fact, I think I'm going to go in a couple of weeks to do our first set of field trials uh, in in a village near Kumbagonam to see how well the technology worked. The reception has been very good. Our idea is to plug that back into that, you know, in, in, in the NIC IT system. Imagine instead of manual entries, this data goes directly there. Potential now for advisory to be done at the village level rather than at the block level. But those system changes will have to come later. Fortunately, cotton also has another uh, uh, player. Cotton is a big crop. Uh, there is a consortium called Better Cotton Initiative, which is like a commercial cons you know, consortium, big buyer of cotton. They work with a lot of foundations. Wellspun, who is our partner, also works in parallel. They also have agriculture extension workers. Those workers are much more educated. They have their own uh, you know, IT system. So we are actually currently working with them, and they have agreed to take our AI and put it as a part of their uh, app uh, for cotton, and then hopefully you know, we will be able to see how that gets used. And so that's So I view the work with Wells Fund Foundation as like an initial, you know, end to end trial on how this could actually, you know, influence the ecosystem so that the government will be motivated to look at that more seriously, right. So those are just three different stories backing up, right. What is it that we are about? So you know, this is the kind of way in which we think ourselves working. Look at problems, work with organizations, understand how AI can help, do build solutions, do field trials and see how the system change can happen. Now, one of the reasons a lot of people like you and a lot of people you know, who are experts in AI, like I used to be, don't get into this is really because you don't know how to get the thing done and implemented and show the impact. Right? One reason you know, it's good to do academic papers is because you know how to do that. You know how to do it, how to do it well, how to have an impact on the research community, other people follow your work. When you go to work in the social domain, how do you get it done? If you work for a company, you know that the company will make products field it so your work is actually again having an impact in the world. What we realized is that a big f problem for innovators in you know, working in advanced uh, technologies like AI is actually the implementation and that's a big discouragement. So we decided we will do it. But how do we do it? By building these partnerships, understanding how to do it and creating networks. So we are not going to do it ourselves. We are not going to become an NGO that's going to go out and you know train ASHA workers. But we know who they are and how to work with them. If we do that, we can actually make that knowledge available to other people who want to collaborate and partner. So we are kind of trying to become or create an AI for social good hub, uh, both in the sense of uh, you know, matching, or, you know, exposing problems to experts and vice versa, and also have you know, opportunities for people to become consultants. A lot of uh, NGOs have no idea what AI is. A lot of government people don't know what AI is. In fact, we found ourselves giving one day AI training uh, course, very high level, what is AI? to a lot of the partners that we work with. I'm not talking about uh, frontline workers. I'm talking about executives, leaders in these NGO organizations that are making decisions. And of course, you know, we can organize activities like summits and hackathons and so on. And of course, a key point is uh, creating a data ecosystem for social good. So this is something I think we haven't yet started, but this is something we will do as we learn more how to collect data and what it means to uh, standardize. I should also say that, you know, we've been working a lot with the government. I mean, we work very closely with MITI, Niti Aayog, the Maharashtra government. Uh, fortunately, uh, we have had a lot of good reception from them. So, as they think about social good AI ecosystems, you know, we can contribute to that. Basically, our mission, right, is to create AI solutions, deploy them, and catalyze AI for social good well beyond what we do, and of course, you know, become a pioneer in doing this. We are able to do this, and we had a great launch on February 18th. We talked about code of conduct. <laughs> well, anyway, so uh, the Prime Minister saw this as an interesting and important mission that he came and inaugurated us last year in Bombay. Naturally, once you get that level of visibility, everybody opens their doors to talk to us, and we've been really, really lucky. And you know, in this, of course, is the Chief Minister of Maharashtra, Governor, Education Minister, VC of Mumbai University, and our donors. And I'll tell you a little bit about our donors. We wouldn't be able to do this. I wouldn't be able to do this. <coughs> but for the generosity of Dr. Ramesh Vadwani and Sunil Vadwani, 
and they have been uh, entrepreneurs very successful, both billionaires from India of course, one from IIT Bombay, other from IIT Madras, settled in the US and they have been doing philanthropic work, two brothers. They got together a couple of years ago, thought hey, why don't we do something that where AI can be applied for social good, found me as a CEO, so I left whatever I was doing to come and do it. They have committed $3 million a year for 10 years and so that is my seed money. I am finding that I know I am going to run out of that money very fast this year, so very much involved in additional fundraising. But I should say that the opportunity has been very good, the reception has been really fantastic from not only our social sector partners, but also collaborators in academia, industry and so forth. And we are talking to companies like Google and Microsoft and Facebook and they are all very interested in seeing how they can bring in their resources. Because we are an Indian organization, because we are a not for profit and because we work on the ground and we have, you know, work, know how to work with the government, uh, it seems like you know, a lot of people would like to work with us. And the same thing I hope is true of you and obviously we are looking for people to come and partner, collaborate with us. You can come, uh, we can you know, work in a research project or students who want to look for internships, other opportunities, do come and talk to us, uh, some of the you know, uh, email uh, links. Our website has more information <coughs> and thank you. This is in relation to the solution that you had for the weighing problem yeah. where the spring balance had some issues and then you were thinking of a smartphone based one. Right. Um, so for that there may be other simpler solutions, uh, an electronic weighing balance which could possibly uh, so communicate the, the to some simple yeah, device. One of the key problems by the way that we have learned is that any physical device that requires any kind of maintenance for a long term hmm. eventually does not get supported in the ecosystem because the supply chain and maintenance problems are severe. One reason we went with this because all the ASHA workers are required to have smartphones. Okay. It is an app that runs on it. So it requires minimum amount of infrastructure to do that. Right? The image based one or yeah. the video based one, what it enables is you can do a lot more things like breathing rates and things like yeah, that. Yeah, we, we are looking at those things? Absolutely. We will, I mean, we are not started on it obviously, but it has come up a lot. In fact, um, there are other conditions besides low birth weight that you may want to monitor. And there is no reason why this approach has to be limited to newborn infants. Yeah, temperature is one of them, but… Yeah. yeah. So, I think the way we look at it is that I think if we start get into the system with one particular thing, there will be other opportunities, right. But the key point is that having a smartphone as a device at the node and data capture through it, because here data is… the ASHA work is not involved in entering any data. It all just goes automatically. So, it is kind of outside of the control. So, that kind of stuff. Maybe I'll ask another question. Sure. I saw many university partners, but yeah. I didn't see IASC. Well, we have opened. We would love to be. <laughs> I'm here, so yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, particularly from Telangana, yeah. is that uh, you know they don't have connections with uh, the ma cotton manufacturers in Bombay. Yeah, the, I, I, which yeah. you can create very easily here. Possibly, yeah. I'm, I mean, this is a problem as we learn to get more into the field. I mean, there are other aspects of the problem, right? For example, one of the, uh, you know, problems that AI often looks at is that um, soil condition and potential yield, crop yield estimation. People are flying drones to do that and so on, right? But likewise, I think as we learn to work with this, as the technology evolves, Hopefully, we can address other challenges that the cotton farmers face. And another thing is, if you look at uh, the, you are working on the TB problem. Yeah. I was looking at the HIV uh, yeah. uh, some years ago along with one of the NGOs in Hyderabad. So, they have similar problems. Uh, yeah, no, so we are not, we are not like uh, focused only on TB, but we have to get started somewhere. I think to add some color, what I forgot to mention is that I, we started uh, February last year. I have a team of about 25 people now. The way we work is that half the team are AI people, scientists, engineers, uh, students, uh, senior people and then about half are product managers and program directors. To do this, what we realize we can't just all be 
AI people. We can't just all be scientists. We actually need people who know how to work, you know, with partners, how to work with government, and how to make products and solutions. So, you know, we are definitely growing. I'm, I, my target is to get to about, you know, 50 or so in a year from now, and uh, hopefully, you know, I can raise the money and build solutions to support. Them. Just one question that uh, for this, uh, you are telling that double production of the cotton. Yeah. So you that's are a, that's to a stated something. goal. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so are you Not just cotton farmers, farmers like yeah, anything? Yeah. yeah. So are you collecting the spatial and historical data? You know, because the spatial and historical data, like uh, weather condition, climatic condition for several so, years. So that, in fact, one of the things that we got into agriculture because there are a number of uh, organizations, right? meteorological and others who have weather data yeah. that we can use at the moment the problem we are solving didn't require it but they are potentially our partners to do that okay right? so thank you that's actually one place where data is available yeah. yeah yeah sorry sir uh, in case of uh, cotton farmers why can't we suggest uh, BT cotton seeds for them to maximize the air efforts? Yeah, so that, I mean, while that is the whole idea of what seeds to plant to get maximum productivity is naturally a problem that agriculture institutions are working on. We are not thinking about that as our problem at Actually, the moment. Actually, by taking those into consideration, right. we can able to maximize with the help of AA as well and uh, yes. double the growth as well. So yeah, I, I think I think it will solve I, a lot of uh, issues. Uh, right. that, uh, so that I think all the aspects, right? How, what to plant, when to plant, how to manage soil, uh, how to prevent loss, as well as the inventory and market side, they are all I think AI amenable. We are just starting at one problem. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Hello, sir. Uh, sir. Yeah. Yeah. This. Yeah. So I have this one question that uh, the problem of that low baby weight that you, the app is uh, considering, right? Low what? The low baby oh, yeah, weight. Yeah, yeah, low birth weight, yeah. yeah. So it is considering the baby weight like part by part or it is considering the baby weight as a whole because there may be certain diseases which lead to the uh, overweight of certain body parts and maybe the less body parts weight for the other body, I mean less weight for other body parts. Actually, you, you make a very interesting point, right? I think it goes back to similar question about it's not just the shape of the baby, the baby's movement okay. may indicate a lot of, um, you know, problems. Uh, the idea is that if we can create a 3D shape model of the baby and it's accurate and track its movements, that may be a way in which we can detect a lot of conditions. Right? But at the moment, we are just focused on the weight. So, yeah. Thank you. So, uh, are you, are, uh, do you have any plans on making the data that you are collecting uh, publicly available? Yeah, so I think, I mean, from our point of view, we want to share all the data and code and everything that we have available. But again, you know, there are natural issues of uh, privacy and all that. So subject to whoever we are working with, like to, to be, exa for example, with the TB data, it's extremely sensitive. Yeah. So the government will not share it with anybody. And that's why, you know, they kind of said, okay, we want to work with you so that we are in the process of finishing an MOU and the conditions for transfer and data are very sensitive. So to the extent that you know we can we can share it without any other kind of challenges, of course we will. Yeah. Uh, just one observation. Uh, in agriculture the weather pattern is critical. The weather. Yeah. yeah. In uh, in evolution of the pests, especially right. insects. Yeah. Uh, that correlation will be very helpful. Right. And the second point is uh, the, the, the s speed at which there are genetic changes and new evolution in, in right, the right. Part is much faster than development of a pesticide yeah. or and insecticide. Yes. So therefore, uh, uh, with global warming, that will become a very critical parameter. Right. Uh, so even if you can identify, you may not have an insecticide which will Right. So you're saying we're going to have to stay for in this problem for the long haul? No. So okay. prediction about yeah. weather change and correlation will be very clear. Yeah. So there are, look, we've talked to one of the, uh, the top people in um, cotton farming, Dr. Uh, Kranti, uh, who used to be the head of uh, Central Institute of Cotton Research in India. And his point is, you know, he was he's saying, look, this is a great problem, but this problem, even if you solve this problem, there's a variety of other things that are actually important. So one of them, for example, is use of pesticides actually destroys the soil. So there is a closed loop, right? 
so but you know we have to get started somewhere yeah we hope that we will be able to provide so, you know value in all the areas but you know you have to start somewhere so, so. okay thanks no further questions thank you very much